to an untrained eye who watches an athlete who is in a 1500 or 5000 meters and they're sat in third, fourth or fifth, I'm guessing waiting to jump, think, oh, he or she, they're out of it now, they've got no chance. But from a professional athlete's perspective, what, what's your comfort zone position-wise and where, where are you like, right, coming in? Yeah, it, it changed over the years. I had to adapt to new athletes coming in, people getting faster, people uh, understanding my tactics. That's what you do. You learn other people's tactics before you learn your own sometimes. And people were starting to figure me out. Um, and I remember going to the World Championships in New Zealand, um, I think it was beginning of 2011. And um, I wasn't fit because I had a slight shoulder injury. And I said to my coach, we did a lot of training in Auckland. And I said, right, I'm going to change my tactics up. Because I used to race from the front. You, like when I was breaking world records, I used to go on the front because I knew no one else could come past me. No one else was quicker than me. I can hold 20 odd mile an hour for three and a half laps. That's the way I'm going to race. But it got to a point where they were catching me or they were getting closer to me on the sprint finish. And so in the world championships, I raced at the back. As soon as the gun went, I went straight to the back. And you could see the other racers, they were just, what's he doing? So I knew that I'd, I've got a good chance now. So I slowed the race down. Um, I remember one guy, I think it was a French guy, went off and made a break, but no one chased him. So I thought, oh, I'm not chasing him. I'll wait and wait, let the others do all the work. And I won the race and <clears throat> I did it in the 800 and the 5,000. I did the same tactics. So I learned from there for being injured and slightly not, not fit that I had to change my tactics because people were learning, learning about me. Um, and, and that's what I did. I, 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 like going back to the question about me being in fourth and fifth, yeah, it's probably the best position I like to be in. I let them do all the work and then pounce at the end. I'd like to ask a, a question from a place of ignorance. I'd, I'd love to learn. I think our, yeah. our viewers will as well. You mentioned trials at Manchester United, mm -hmm. so I'm going to kind of link football and hockey a little bit. As a defender within hockey, you're a tall guy, so in, in, if it was football, you'd be a right, tall guy, good, get your head on it. What are the benefits or the difficulties of being tall as a defender in hockey? I guess it's one big thing is reach. So obviously with football, long legs is a similar thing. Same thing with long arms. Um, so technically in a stable position, you're all right. But the problem is, is with the forwards that you get, naturally, same with football, if you've got someone quick and nippy around you, it's not necessarily great being big, but once you understand, so once you understand basically the real positives of being a big guy, so for example, me, I'm a six foot three frame, right, okay, well, I can use that so I can be a little bit more physical, I can use my body space a lot more, in the same way you would with basketball, if you were seven foot two, you'd box out a lot more, you'd probably be a center or you'd be that kind of position where you'd really would just basically dominate the space you're in. That's what I've got to, and learning to do, especially where I'm at now. So I now know my body space and I know what I can and can't do. Is that, what's that evolution like, kind of linking life in terms of, we'll have uh, to, to find confidence in who we are as a person, whether that's being tall or, you know, the frame that you have, as well as learning in a, in a sporting capacity. Did you learn that from a young age or did that experience come later on? So I was originally a forward uh, midfielder. Basically, I was a real quick bloke, but I was also quite long as well, so I could run for days, which was great. Um, and then at 17, I basically had spinal fractures from overtraining during a growth spurt, basically. Um, and then kind of my game changed completely, so I just naturally just graduated back. Um, so now, I kind of had to learn new strengths, which is quite a weird thing to do at 18, 19, when you, you should be more established as a player and traits. Um, so le again, learning on the job was great because I had to learn them quite quickly or else my team wasn't gonna succeed. Um, so I guess from that point of view, it's just knowing your strengths and knowing what you can do and really believing in what you can do. So for me, I'm a really good passer of the ball. Simply, I can, I've got a good range of passing, which is great for hockey because if you can play back to front quick, it's a real game changer for your team because you can literally turn defence into an opportunity. Um, 
And then on the flip side, I'm a really good communicator. So again, in, for my position, that's great. I sit at centre back, I can talk to people, I can orchestrate everything going around and I can read the game pretty well. So from that, it's a, they're my key strengths that I've basically learned from being a defender rather than what originally would have been as a midfield forward where I was actually, I was pretty quick and I was pretty dynamic. Whereas I've now got to find them again <laughs> later on in career, which is a little bit more difficult. We've recently seen the well-deserved retirement of Matchroom CEO, Barry Hearn. What role do you feel you played in each other's careers? <clears throat> oh, well, um, once again, being in the, that right place at the right time was, was um, wonderfully fortuitous. Um, the role I play in Barry's, Barry's success, I think, is, is, is only the sliding doors part of it. His talent is hasn't. I've not taught him how to do what he does. I mean, I just used to be in awe of how good he was at selling anything to anybody, um, and also the way he did it with a with a panache that they. I'm not saying they enjoyed having their trousers taken down, but they 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 quite like you know he, he was he's a great salesman, um, but also he's not he's not a con artist. He gives people value. And that's why it works. He, and he's tr you know, totally 100% trustworthy. We had an event once where the sponsors pulled out all the prize money, no prize money. He paid it off to the players. A long time ago, people forget it a bit. But he's true to the sports person. He's got them at heart and he won't turn anybody, he won't turn these people over. So that for me was like, yeah, good as anything. Drives a hard bargain, but f totally fair. Um, uh, obviously, I was his first. Um, player person that he was representing and we learned the trade together and it was great fun he was like my older brother he was 10 years older than me and it, it but he was he was completely opposite style of person to me and it was we felt like we sort of merged well but watching him in action and watching him grow into the various roles as first as a management company and then becoming um, TV production and then moving it further into you know far bigger TV production, you know, taking over sports. Uh, it's just been astonishing to watch. And now that he's retired, it just seems like, it's just like an era has gone of thinking, well, surely he still, he hasn't retired. You know, he's, 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 he's timeless, he could go on forever. And I still, it remains to be seen whether he can take enough of a, of a back uh, step that he doesn't want to still get involved. Because I think he's still got a lot to offer. But somewhere down the line, I think he deserves his retirement because he, what a grafter. If anybody realised the, uh, the, the hours he, he's done and anybody moans about their lot, he'd say to them, you never, you never worked hard enough. He, he, you'd have to see him in action. He, I, mean, I as a, I'm, I'm a lazy, total lazy bastard compared to him, I, you know, I go and practice, put you know, a few hours practising. But if anybody, if you ever wanted to know what you have to do to pay the price to become good at something and give yourself a chance to be successful, he, he knows, he's, he's got the, the secret to success and he'll tell you you're not working hard enough, you're not putting in the graft, you're not thinking outside the box enough, but you're not grafting hard enough. Because he, he's hours, I mean I don't think he ever slept, doesn't feel like that. Was it a benefit to your career having him on side, do you believe? It was a massive benefit that to have him in my corner because while I was doing my job on the table, I wasn't necessarily overtly um, that way. I was quiet and unassuming, relatively shy. Learned. I started to come out of my shell when I had a cue in my hand, and then the more TV stuff you did, the more you started to realise that oh, maybe things are not as the, the world's a nicer place. Maybe you can enjoy yourself a bit more. But having Barry in my corner was. Uh, was quite astonishing because he had the bravado that I didn't have. So while I could sort of quietly go about my job and not put myself under pressure by saying I'm going to win, he, he was saying that for me. So he was like my mouthpiece in a nice way. And then to have somebody in your corner who was always fighting for you and also was really able to sell you as a commodity uh, far better than anybody, anybody else in in our world had, had sort of come along before, that was great as well. So it, it gave me a confidence that we were a team. Mm. And in an individual sport, 
there's n it's something nice to be a team. It takes the pressure off in a, in a strange way. You feel like you're able to work for somebody else, even though you're not. Mm. So I had my father, who was my coach, and we were a team there. I had Barry as that team. And between the, the trip ticket, it ticked boxes that meant that I, I could, there was momentum and it felt like it was something that wasn't going to stop for a while. So we, we got, we went, once, once it started, it, and it felt like all the, all the other players started to think that I was unbeatable mm. because of the momentum and Barry Curry, he's unbeatable. <laughs> so, oh, he's, he's unbeatable, great. And then all of a sudden you, you, know, you, you spot a player you're playing against that day and you see him checking out at the hotel that morning because they think they're going to lose. Great. <laughs> Perfect. And what position he's left the business in as well, obviously, handing it to save hands, yeah. chip off the old block, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, my godson, apparently. Yeah, yeah. no, he's made. Yeah. I, 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 still don't, I think he probably, uh, I, I don't think it's worth me buying him in presents anymore. I can't <laughs> get him any presents he can't get himself. Uh, time to return the favour, yeah, maybe. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, right. I, I, I don't see the. Um, uh, yeah. He's, he's got a wonderful business. A matchroom is just a family run thing, you know. It's it's crazy to have seen it grow. Uh, and I've sort of, I don't watch it that far from, I've watched it from afar now, but I'm just astonished to think how many, how many staff involved in matchroom sport and how many sports they've buried, ba uh, single handedly buried as well, but now there's a bigger operation than that. How many sports they've touched and how much entertainment they've given to th the sports fan. Not just in um, snooker, golf, darts, fishing, fishing, temping, bowling, ping pong. It's fisher mania. Six hours live fishing on Sky. Live fishing. I mean, you know, if if that doesn't tell you he's a good salesman, nothing does. But everybody in the fishing world absolutely loved it because it was real, mm. and it was for the people. So everything he's done, he's done with that in mind, because he, he's a he's sort of frustrated sports person, um, but he's got he's got that his heart. Whatever he produces, like the Moscone Cup nine ball pool, creates an event from scratch, and it grows into something that is that is legendary, and that probably as much as anything else. But there's loads in, in each sport that he's been involved in, and if anybody needed recognition, uh, he got an OBE recently. That's a recognition, yes. But he's had recognition in loads of sports when they put him in their hall of, halls of fame because what he's done for that sport and the fans of those sports. Quite, quite amazing. Mm. Yeah. A man of the people and we wish him his best for his retirement. We'll see if it yeah. lasts. But yeah. I mean, not everybody likes him. You know, some people you know, can't stand, like, you know, he sort of comes out with sayings. He's very, very, you know, black and white in what he, but, um, but, but most people, once they meet him, go, oh, actually, even though he, he, talks, a, he talks a game on TV and I don't like the brashness or the, the bigness of it or whatever, when you actually meet him, mm. it sort of makes sense that he's actually not, it's not total bravado. There's a lot, there's a lot of sort of feeling behind it as well. But yeah, I am biased because I'm his mate. But you've seen him step up and pay the money when required. It's very charitable. Yeah, uh, f uh, sorry, charity-focused individual as well. So. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, um, you know, what he's done behind the scenes, uh, charity-wise, quite immense as well. Set up a, a charity. I think there was like, I don't know, like ticket sales from darts, mm. the World Championship, something like a pound from every ticket sale went towards. It's, it's, it's got a charity arm to it, and it, it does a lot with St Francis Hospice in our area in, in Essex. And um, yeah, yeah, but, I mean, that, you'd expect that, you know. You know, knowing him, you'd expect that he would be giving a lot back yeah, to his area. Let's uh, let's wish Barry well and yeah. come back to Steve Davis. Yeah, well, hopefully, I get a few more games of golf with him because yes. you know that's that's a level playing field. But well, it's not actually because he's useless. <laughs> hopefully, he improves with more practice. We will see. You had the year off mm. before the Dominico Spada performance again, with injuries, yeah. um, you passed that test and you went on to fight a certain person by the name of Sergio Martinez. Mm. Um, before we kind of dig a little bit into that, for him, that was a year after he brutally KO'd Paul Williams, which yeah. was, yeah. to this day, 
um, if you if you went onto certain sites, you could you watch that multiple yeah. times and it gets sent around. Unfortunately, I see that multiple times in the build-up. So, like, every time I put the telly on, every time I look in on my phone, I seen Paul Williams get knocked spark out. <laughs> you know, I've like, oh, got to fight this geezer. <laughs> and he had a granite chin. Yeah. Paul Williams. Um, yeah. Well, up until that he point. Did, yeah. Yeah. How, how do you, when you see that, how do you channel your, your focus? How do you deal with that from an emotional laying in your, your bed at night thinking about it? Good question. Good question. And it's a, it's a question and, and a fight I do think about a lot. Um, in in an in two in two ways, if you like, in in a way that the experience I learned from fighting Martinez was so invaluable that that's that experience certainly helped me in that fight with Daniel Gill when I won the world title, no doubt. Being in a world title fight, being in the states, Michael Buffer announcing your name, just everything. And, we won't um, talk about that too much. No, no, we won't. Yeah, Darren Baker. Um, <laughs> But on the flip side, when I look back at it and being the competitive man that I am, I think, I, look, I'm not saying I, I could have beaten him, but I could have done better. I know I could have. You know, um, it was an unfortunate blow that I perforated my eardrum in the 10th round. I just couldn't feel my legs. It was really weird. And that was the first thing I wanted to do when I got back to the change room was see the shot. But when I look back, the game plan was spot on up to six rounds. Frustrate the great champion, get the crowd against him. I'm the, the unknown uh, Brit who's got no chance. You know, uh, uh, you know, unsettled Martinez. And I was doing that to a T. And then the, the, the game plan was to midway point, turn the screw, get down to work. And he done that, I didn't. And I think to myself, mm, I could have. Do you know what, I could have. But was it the Paul Williams knockout that I'm seeing? I, I don't know. I, I would just like to dig a little bit deeper, if, if I may, yeah. without being too uh, intrusive on that period of your life. But as a human being, as an athlete, you say you dealt with it and you had to go through a lot. What were some of the processes you had to go through to handle that at the time? Um, so we, we're very fortunate that we've got um, amazing psychologists. And so Andrew at the time, uh, we actually changed over our psychologists in that period. And so I think working with her from a, a fresh start, really understanding myself and what makes me tick. And um, yeah, I think just it's knowing the triggers of, of what do I look like when I'm playing my best? What do I look like when I'm not? And I think for, for a lot of the time, I almost was a, the coaches were saying I wasn't doing this and I was, it was almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. So then, because I didn't believe in myself, I wasn't getting myself out of that. So the actual psychological work with her and understanding the triggers or what do I look like when I am playing better definitely helped. But then, to be honest, Brett, Surbiton, my family, my friends were my key support system. And they'd see me at pretty low times um, after non-selections. And at that point where you're just low that you don't, you don't believe in yourself and you've got that yeah devil on your shoulder that is just reinforcing all those negative thoughts so it's understanding that that is just a side of you of your brain and actually there's so much more to be positive and just to come out with a positive mindset and it's hard to just say believe in yourself because of course that's really easy to say but if you haven't got the things backed up so it's almost I did write a journal I used to write down before I went to bed things that I thought I did well or things Basically, it's almost big yourself up that you get yourself to get back to that point of why, why was I selected for GB? Why am I in this team? What can I bring to this team? And really have to convince myself again that I am good enough and that I deserve to be here. Um, and then once you do have that, you almost then you then go higher. And it's all it is within yourself. And I think obviously if you can have a psychologist to help you do all those kind of things. But um, if you believe you can or you can't, Either way, that's what it will be. So I think it's having that positive mindset. For me, as soon as negative thoughts come into my head, I need to get them out because if I listen to them, then that's where I go into a bit of a, a spiral. So being positive, focusing on the things that you can do to improve. One thing that I also did was, um, you're, especially in a high pressurised environment, you're always told things that you need to work on. And I am i wouldn't say I'm a perfectionist, but I'm someone that wants to be you know, at the top of their game in each sec section. So when someone tells me that I need to improve or something, I get focused on getting better at that thing. And I think that's where I went a bit wrong because I, I kept focusing on something that I needed to improve, but I was 
it's such a long period of time you're never going to get from if you need to improve it to the best in the squad the best in the world at that one thing instead I've got strengths which me this is why I've been picked so actually focusing on your strengths and what your value is to the, the team making those your absolute super strengths that's then where the, the value is and the magic and that's where you'll actually put yourself in real contention to be selected because that's why you're in the team in the first place yes you keep then working on all the things that the coaches want you to work on but they go on in the background that you constantly chip away at but they shouldn't be your sole focus because for me anyway when I made that my sole focus that's when I got negative because I, I still wasn't quite good enough at them or I'm not as good at them at them whereas actually I need to focus on what my strengths are and actually deliver those consistently on a daily basis and then that's how I've been able to get back into the team but yeah with a lot of help and support from family and friends around me as well. We A friend of Sports Hub Video, Darren Barker, has spoken to us about the devil on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, once he was able to understand that process and how to manage the mentality of sport and, and the trials and tribulations, mm -hmm. he got on to win a world title. So you're in good company, it's a good <laughs> process. I couldn't speak with you without touching upon the 2005-2006 season. It was a good season for the club, finishing in the top 10, and most notably, an excellent run to the final of the FA Cup at Millennium Stadium. As a West Ham fan, how did it feel to wake up knowing you'd be playing in the FA Cup final for that boyhood club? Yeah, I think it's a massive achievement, you know. I think um, the last time the, the club was in the final was 1980 and they won 1-0 against Arsenal. So it was a massive, massive achievement for the whole club in general. Uh, but for, for me as a, as a fan, knowing that I'm, I'm waking up to play in a cup final, it, it, it was unbelievable. A little bit hurt me because it won at Wembley in, in, in London and the National Stadium but when you go to the Millennium and, and you play there it, it was a fantastic stadium and it for, for the overall day it was fantastic it just it, you just accept the result really. Of course and sorry to say we will come on to that <laughs> <laughs> but we'll take it step by step and, and regardless of result there is no doubt it will be remembered as one of the greatest cup finals in modern history at the very least if not of all time. Um, what are your memories of the game? Um, obviously starting off really well, going 2 new up against a fantastic Liverpool team. Um, in, in the driving seat, if you like, it, it, was a, it was a roasting hot day, but I think when you score two early goals it, against a club like that, you, you think this could be your day. And as a player, as a fan, regardless, it doesn't matter. I think when you go 2 new up, you may be expecting the, the door to shut shut shop and uh, to go on and win the game. But we, we know what talent that that, uh, that that club had and and it proved on the day what, what players they've got are fantastic. Um, and sadly enough, they, they got back into it and and then you go on again and, and score to go 3-2 up. Who scored that goal? <laughs> Me. <laughs> but listen, at, at the time, I. I when I score, I think there's like four or five minutes left. But obviously, watching it back and looking back now, there's, there's like 25 minutes left. So uh, it's still going to be a tough task. And when when you see the ball go up for injury time and and you're still winning, you think we're, we're gonna we're gonna do it. And and then there's, if you mis a mistake, if you like, or whatever. But a player like Steven Gerrard's ability, he's probably the only one that can go and do what he done to to get the club back into it and um, when you look back now it was it was an unbelievable strike but maybe we could have done better not not to concede that. I think there's various ways of looking at the game but you touched on what West Ham fans and many football fans look for from their players and you stuck it on them, they got back in it, you went again and it didn't work out but I think you can be proud as a, as a team and an individual of, of the day as well. Um, the game went to uh, penalties um, via extra time, obviously. Now you've had time to reflect on it. Um, what are your latter thoughts of, of that day? Now you can look back in a, with a calmer head. Um, yes, listen, I, I didn't, I've didn't. i never watched it since up until last year. or in, I think it was in lockdown. Uh, they put the cup final on and I sat down with my, my little boy at the time and watched it and... Um, Looking back now, you 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 put up until three two. I think we're we're a better team, and you look at the throw on that 
we give it straight back to Liverpool, maybe we can do better than that. Um, and then that, that goal doesn't come, you win 3-2. But it goes on and it goes to extra time. I think Hale would have one right in the, in, the, in the last set. He had cramp and he couldn't move his feet and he's missed it with his left foot. So that's another chance you put down that maybe that's, that's a winner. But then it goes to penalties and I think that's anyone's game, you know. Um, we, we miss three, I miss one, I think Anton missed one and Bobby Zamora, I think. So there's three, three penalty takers that wanted to take them, missed them and unfortunately Liverpool were a better team on, on, on the penalties. 2009 bought a very interesting move to uh, the oldest professional club in Britain, Notts County, who of course in the midst of a takeover from a mystery investor at the time. It came at a time when Sven Goran Eriksson was named director of football, Kasper Schmeichel signed from Man City and Sol Campbell came in from Portsmouth. Um, Sol made his debut away to Morecambe and left halfway through a training session the following week. I would just love for you to reflect on that period because I don't know the questions to ask to this. So. It was a mad time. It was a mad time. I mean, you touched on some of it there. Like, I was at Colchester and Paul Lambert had come in and I was out of favour. He didn't fancy me and, and I knew I needed to get out of there. But I, I honestly didn't know where I was going at that stage. Um, I was talking to, to Parkey that summer about trying to come to Charlton and I was desperate to, to go there, really. And he kept saying, yeah, it may happen, it may happen, it may not. But, you know, it was, it was dragging on and on and on. And I was starting to think, I need to look for something else. But there wasn't, there wasn't really anything else coming up. And then, you know, there was all this, you kept seeing it every day, someone was signing for Notts County, like something mad's going on there. Like, and then bang, I got a call out, out of the blue. I was playing golf. Um, I remember it, I was playing golf and the phone goes and it was the Notts County manager at the time. It was uh, uh, Charlie McPartland. Obviously Sven was there and he said like, will you, will you come up and, and talk to us? Like we're interested in signing So I was like, yes, I will. Um, even though it was League Two, like, you know, you was hearing all these mad stories and you know, they was throwing money about and like, obviously Casper had signed at that stage already. You know, Lee Hughes up front, who was terrific at that level. They was building a night an unbelievable side for the level. Um, so I went up there, spoke to him, you know, this grand five-year plan about Sven's laying it out, about how we're going to be in the Premier League in five years and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And, you know, it was nice money and stuff like that. So I was like, yeah, I'll have a bit of this. I'll have a bit of this. I didn't really want to play like League Two. You know, I felt I was better than that, but I knew that it was because, you know, there was, there was something better coming. So I jumped on board, yeah, we had, you know, we had Casper in goal, like they, they basically built like a championship side in a year, Seoul come in. There was mad rumours that, you know, Nedved was going to sign, he was hearing all these mad names and he was like, yeah, of course they are, but then when Seoul Campbell walks through the door, you're like, well hang about, if he can come, like, anyone can come, Casper Schmeichel's your goalie, and like, it's like, well, it, it was nuts, it was a nutty year and like, we basically, like, we won every week. And uh, like we ended up like romping the league. So it was a good year. But by the December, the mystery owner, how you put it, had disappeared. Um, all the money had gone. And everything, this five year plan was, was up in smoke. And we was all like, Jesus, what are we going to do now? So then I was trying to get out of there. Um, so it was like a whirlwind sort of, I think by the January, I was at Charlton already on loan. I only signed in August um, and ended up going to Charlton on loan, going back to Notts County, finishing the season. Like we won the league um, for my first sort of medal in football and it, it, was, it was good, but it was, it was a crazy time. Like the, the Seoul one was, was mad. He walked in and obviously I'd played with Seoul at, at Spurs. And I was like, I can't, can't believe that he's at Notts County in League Two. And uh, he come, he turned out he weren't in great shape, so I don't know if he was out of contract at Portsmouth and hadn't been training or whatever. Um, played this game at Morecambe, and when I tell you he got the run around by like two journeymen forwards, and you could see that he was like, he was thinking, oh, what am I doing? What am I doing here? And, and like, like you said, literally we was training on the Monday, and uh, it was like we didn't... We didn't have like our own training ground, so we'd get changed at, at the stadium. We'd all have to drive our cars 
to the training ground, get out, train, drive back. Um, Mid session, we ran around souls, just give it, all right, sorry lads, this ain't for me. Shook everyone's hand, said, I'm, I'm gone, I'm out of here. And we were like, what? He's like, yeah, gone, bang, in the motor, back to the ground, got changed, never saw him again. We got back there. Like, it was all laughing, it was crazy. It was like, nah, is he coming back? And, and he's like, no, nah, he's gone. Took all his gear, ripped up his contract, just decided weren't for him. Like, I mean, God knows what he signed for or what he was promised. And like, you know, he probably never saw any of it. He probably just like, oh, yeah, this ain't this ain't what I signed up for. But crazy it was a time mad, nonetheless. Mad one, yeah. So you are the captain. You play for England. You play for Great Britain. You're pro, you, you're there all the time, this is your life. The team is immersed with amateur players, for want of a better way of putting it. How do you have to balance frustrations in maybe people turn up late from work, um, performance standards, fitness levels? Um, to be honest, I think, again, with that, what Brett enables is we, we are, we're not strict, but, you know, we... So there are certain players in the team who often can't get there on time because of work, but we know they're trying everything they can to get there as quick as they can. And it's not that they they can't be bothered and they, they're not taking it serious, seriously. Everyone knows that you turn up to training and you want to do well. Um, but also for me, the club side is, is my enjoyment. Not that I don't enjoy the GB, that, that it, it is training is more relaxed and you can have a good time. And so for me, throughout times in my career where things haven't been going well and I haven't really been confident playing for Team GB, actually me going to club is where I've sort of found myself again and you, you actually remember what it's all about, why you play and you're playing with your, your friends. And yes, of course, you're still being really competitive and I'm still going to tell people if they're not jumping back tackling or they're not trying hard enough, but everybody steps out onto the pitch to try to do their best. And, and I think once you know that, then... You might have a frustration in a minute, but it doesn't last particularly long. And actually just playing with a smile on your face. So for me, that's the most important thing. And without Surbiton, I definitely wouldn't be at the position I am now. And even having played for GB, at times where it was really tough, I wouldn't have been able to get back up to be back playing and selected for GB without Surbiton. So I don't think those frustrations last particularly long. And to be honest, I love every, every minute when I'm playing there. So I know this won't relate to you, but... When has there ever been a situation where uh, an England or Team GB player has not quite put the performance in, not quite tracked back when they should and have been told by an amateur player, pull yourself together? To be fair, I think, so there's a couple of players in our team who, um, so one of them used to play for GB. Um, she didn't actually make too many uh, appearances, but she's a northern, hard, gritty girl and she has a voice on her and she will shout and you, everyone just knows that that's what she brings to the team. And so no matter who it is, she's going to shout at you and work hard. And, and I think the beauty is there's no, there's not really any egos in our team. So if, so training the other day, if she shouts at me saying, you should attract your player, you go, yeah, you're right, I should have. And then, and that's all she wants as well. It's the recognition, holding your hands up. Yeah, I, in that moment, I should have been better. But actually, what are you going to do next? Okay, I'm going to, for the team, I'm going to, and for me, I'm going to do better. Um, so I think everyone has that knowledge and even if, in, yeah, he might be absolutely knackered. I've, there's a lot of times you turn up to Serbs in training and then a match and it's been, I've really got to dig deep here to put in a performance. And there might be a split second where you've not been able to track that player or whatever, not gone on, on to the attack. And you, you need your teammates to get behind you and shout at you. And I don't think that's a, a bad thing. It just helps you come back in and, and then actually go again. So I think uh, there's different pe people in the team that you'll know that they'll come from, but they're only doing that to help the whole team out. So you accept it and get better next time. Okay. So it sounds like you've had that as well. I think everyone's had it, to be <laughs> honest. It, it might, it's not like you're saying the whole game you've been terrible. It might just be in a, in a run back. You're absolutely exhausted and you haven't quite made it and you just need your teammates to, to help you out. And it's not in a, a real negative way, like you're screaming at each other. It's saying, come on, next one you need to do better. And you go, yeah. Got it. Obviously, within a, a close uh, group, you've got Dillian, Richard Riakpour, um, who no doubt you've sparred with both guys mm. many, many times. You've also sparred with uh, Alexander Usyk and Tyson Fury. That's some real pedigree as well. How how was that, and, and what was the experience like? Yeah, that was um, that was really good. It was 
like so with the UC one, it was the first time I went to um, away for a sparring camp on my own. So I went to Ukraine on my own, and and it was a weird experience because it was like the first time I'd ever done it, and I wasn't really kind of sure on the rules and how you do it and and what they expect from you. So I just kind of I took myself there and just got involved and and got stuck in kind of how I know best, and and it worked well for that. And they've invited me back since numerous times and things. So that went really well and, and credit to Yusik and his team, like they really looked after me the first time I was there and, and really kind of made sure I felt at home and, and looked after and everything was cool and I wasn't kind of too far out of my comfort zone with that. And then with obviously Fury, that was up in Manchester and me and my team know, his, his trainer at the time was Ben Davidson, we knew Ben, we knew ben very well, so that was a very comfortable session and stuff. And it was, it was great to just, be able to share the ring with these people and like I say, pick their brains a bit and, and figure out, like give them questions and see see why they do things. Fantastic. And I'm sure that that has uh, played a part in some of your performances since. What's the most notable thing you would have picked up from either one of those guys? Uh, with you, the, the thing I picked up with him the most was that your training is not just about the physical aspect, it's about your mind, it's about like from when I would be with him and, and would have our sparring sessions, they would last, it would be like an hour before we'd spar and then there'd be an hour afterwards, but there'd be a mix of different things between like pushing your body to certain points. Okay, yeah, but then there's, there's like mind, not mind games, but well, I guess they are like little games or little ways to get the brain to keep firing while you're like, they keep the brain going while your body's tired. So you remember to switch on so you don't, so in the middle of a fight, you don't know, switch off, that your brain's still ticking over, still, even while all that kind of fatigue and stuff is floating through your body and you're, you're feeling it and you're tired and stuff, there's little kind of little mind things they do to just keep you going and going and going. So that was something I learned that there's a lot more to training than just the physical aspects. I always had to imagine that my opponent was training harder than me and it become, it was a bit of a sick, psychotic way to look at things because you could never train hard enough and it used to I, it's why I used to hate training so much because anyone who says oh, I love training I love this brother you, you're talking rubbish or you're not training hard enough you can't be because if you trained as hard as I did you physically want to be sick or, or you almost want to cry every session because you I'm telling you now that ring is the most lonely place in the world if you're not prepared properly we don't have to name names as such but um, from a professional athlete perspective professional hockey player how accepting are players of team rules, team strategies, in the sense of players that may have be alongside you in defence but want to kind of step out a bit more and carry the ball, but that's not what they've been told to do? I think it's a combination of a player and coach responsibility, just having the conversations to know where you both are because most coaches you have, so our coach at Surbiton, for example, so there's two fullbacks, myself and... A guy called Luke Taylor. Luke's very different to me, but has cracking strengths as well, which we complement each other. So Luke, for example, can throw an aerial, so long ball, and chuck it 70, 75 yards, which means no team can basically full, full press us because we've got the ability to play over the top of everybody. And then we've got arguably the most lethal forward in the league. What a cracking news. Come and play against us type thing. <laughs> like, yeah. fine. Um, whereas I'm a lot more on the floor and a lot more... I'm more of a carrier so we've had the conversation over the years with the coach and he's been he's really comfortable with kind of just saying do you know what boys you can play you know how to play we'll just orchestrate things around you and that's what we've adapted as a group this year massively to basically get how can we get the best strengths out of the team so it's it's been a case of all of us adapting to work on the same frame if that makes sense so i wouldn't so much say it's, it's probably more of a conversation to have and having the confidence to have the conversation to find the positives from both sides, the coach's side and the player's side. At times, the sport of wrestling brings true crossover stars such as Ronda Rousey. In your opinion, what has Ronda's impact been on the sport? Oh, I think it's been massive because it wasn't just wrestling where women were having an evolution, it was in sports as a whole. And there's a lot of people you can look at, but certainly Ronda, especially when you talk about the world of fighting, you know, she was huge. She kind of put women's MMA on the map and uh, her coming over to wrestling as well. I mean, she's incredible as well 
Um, but it was a big deal, you know, it was one of those kind of things that people were like, oh my God, wait, Ronda Rousey's in WWE, and then anyone she wrestled, they kind of got a spotlight on them, and then the person they, you know, so it was like a knock-on effect where she brought all these eyes to the product, and um, yeah, she was incredible for women in sport, and definitely in WWE too. I think Ronda's um, persona developed a lot further back in time than, than the wrestling side yeah. of MMA. She evolved it into the wrestling to a much greater scale. When you see that path, how important is it for you to, to keep working on that side of things for yourself? Uh, definitely really important. I mean, it's funny you actually bring up Ronda. I watched her debut last night and it's incredible how different she is from all the other girls because she gets in the ring and she's like a f proper fighter, like legit. But that's what makes her unique. It's like, why would she come out and be like, yay, yay? Because she's not like she's, you know, she's the baddest woman on the planet. That's what she was built at, and it's true. So it's just so important that she has this energy about her. And that kind of always makes me think, one, how important it is to work hard. Because when you think about Ronda's journey and all the different things she's done, Olympics, MMA, WWE, yeah, she, you know, I'm not an MMA fighter, but what can I do that's different? What can I bring to the table that's different from everyone else? How can I stand out? And I think Ronda had this energy about her, despite, you know, okay, she, everyone knew she was a big deal. There was something about her, I think, even if she just came in the doors and she didn't have a name to her, she just had this sort of fiery passion in her and you just thought, okay, all right, like, you know, and it was really exciting for the fans. A bit of a random one here, but just interesting for me. If Snooker, for some reason, was to introduce a doubles tournament, what player would best complement your game? I don't think they'd like to play with me now, but um, if, if, uh, well, uh, if, if I had to pick a doubles partner now, um, obviously you, you know, you pick some of the current crop because they're brilliant, but I, it would be fun to play with Stephen Hendry. Although I don't think we'd be able to sort of stop laughing or take it because actually he's funny. Yeah, he's a funny guy, and and uh, he's also he's a trainee. Um, Larry David. He thinks, he thinks he's Larry David from from uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, and he's. It would be very funny to sit in the corner with him while we were watching two other players play. Um, whether or not we gel, we dovetail nicely. I don't know. But Stephen Hendry took the game to another level when he when he sort of superseded my standard. Uh, he became far more of a, a the modern day player of a, a, aggressive. If you sort of once again, apologies for making analogies with other sports, but they do seem to sort of tie in well. If you took Nick Faldo, who was me, and was was a paring machine, and won events, not saying he can make a birdie, obviously, but centre of the green played the game wonderfully well, okay. But then the next generation started attacking the flag more and pushing the boundaries, and that's what's happened to snooker. Stephen Hendry was the first player who started to change the balance of attack and defend and realised that attacking was the right way forward, whereas my generation and the people that I learned from were like, well, be careful, in a nutshell. Then, so, so the modern day game owes a lot, and the modern day player owes a lot to Stephen Hendry for changing the, uh, shot, the shot selection, uh, you know, what's right and wrong. Uh, so it would be fun to play with him, because you know, we could have a, we could have a good, good game, I'm sure, but uh, we'd probably end up cancelling each other out and just <laughs> arguing. I'd pay to watch it. <laughs> yeah, it'd be fun. I don't know who we play, we get slaughtered. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be good to watch. And your next move is one that I'd imagine meant a, a lot to you and the family, uh, being a West Ham fan, it was of course to West Ham United. How did it feel to pull on the famous claret and blue? Yeah, like you just say, it's, uh, it meant a lot to me. Um, growing up as a kid, going to the to Upton Park as a kid, supporting West Ham, it's put, uh, like a dream come true to go and play and get that opportunity to put that shirt on and walk out Upton Park with the bubble song singing for you rather than you singing it as a, as a kid but yeah it was a dream come true to go and play for for my for my team and i support as, as a kid and and still support now so you didn't sing it under your breath as you <laughs> i probably did <laughs> <laughs> i probably did but um you know it's, it's a lot different you trying to focus but you know when you, you when you're standing there singing it and you and people are shouting it um you, you get that little lump in your throat, if you like, when you're walking in the tunnel and, and, and people are singing it when you're coming out. And West Ham fans, um, I think it's clear for all to see uh, some of the best fans in, in football, in the Premier League. And um, 
would have meant a lot to them having one of their own play for them. Yeah, I'd like to think so. Um, and at the time, we we had a, we had a great squad and a great team, uh, which I think it makes it a lot easier. Um, and as a West Ham fan, but knowing what West Ham fans are like, I think first and foremost they want you to give 110 percent every time you put the shirt on. And I can say that I've done that for the seventy odd games that I play for the club, and it meant so much to me to to play every game. You were also involved uh, in scouting for. England under 16s and 17s are uh, um, probably about 10 years ago, I'd say. Yep. Um, who might you have seen in that time that's gone on to achieve something notable in the game? Uh, Jack Wilshire, uh, probably the one that just comes to mind straight away. There's uh, a lad called uh, J. Emmanuel Thomas who didn't, you know, sort of he made it, but not, you know, sort of think he's flirting around in Scotland now. Uh, but Jack would probably be the most obvious one. Um, there was a lot of lads that uh, at, at Arsenal, um, but um, yeah, I think Jack would probably be the, the the biggest one where he was a very young lad, uh, 13, 14, playing an under 18 football, and he was just amazing. You know, probably in youth football, I've only seen so people like Vinny Samways would probably be another one that would be standing out. They because late in my year. Area would uh, would be another one that would stand out in in youth football, um, but Jack was an immense at, at a very young age, and it's just a shame that work, what's worked out and you know sort of not fulfilling what you would say would be an incredible amount of promise uh, at, at Arsenal. What was it you saw in him from a um, with an experienced strategic eye that you have to someone like myself who hasn't played the game at that level? What is it you see in Jack or saw in Jack that yep. just elevated him above the rest of the players? Uh, a complete lack of fear, uh, the uh, willingness to foul. He just was incredible that what he did and what he tried and really didn't give a monkey's whether the, the coaches were having a go at him or praising him or anything like that. Uh, a, a steely adult like determination uh, and anger um, and it was all for me that was a positive you know it, it probably might not be to other coaches um, but that fact that he was 14 trying to hold off 18 19 year old uh, players is, is is a real testament and, 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 and did it you know quite easily as well you, you touched earlier on the fact that um players that are injured or facing challenges within their uh, career at that moment in time, they need to stay off social media, they need to stick around their family and their friends. Yep. Um, I didn't know you was gonna mention Jack Wilshere, but it kind of ties in quite nicely with that. Where do you think he should go? What do you what do you see the kind of latter part of his career uh, being? Well, I mean, it's, it all depends what he want, what he wants to do. You know, I mean, he's, he, he, he is and should be, you know, financially secure for the rest of his life. I know that isn't a problem, but, you know, the, the, the difference that I can't sort of probably get my head around is that I always had to play football to pay a mortgage uh, or to pay a bill or to whatever. And it wasn't the fact that I didn't enjoy it. It wasn't the fact that it was, but it was, it was classed as a job for me. Um, now, these lads... He can walk away from it if he wants to, and 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 what I would say to you know people that are in the game for a long period of time is that it isn't easy, and it isn't easy. You know, I think Jack's twenty eight, but he's had a hell of a lot of injuries, and I do feel that fo football footballers and their careers, I mean, it's very much like a car. I know that sounds you know sort of a bit too drastic, but uh, you know it's mileage, and I think that those injuries put the clock up a little bit more with the mileage and, and, and he might not fancy doing it. I probably would say that if he wanted a, a an easier route, and I don't mean this to be disrespectful to, to, to the league, but probably the States might be an opportunity. Uh, does he need another payday? No, but you know that would be the States or, or China or places like that if he wanted to do it. Um, I'd love him to probably go into a championship club and, 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 and really give himself a, a, a test at 28 because, you know, you're a long time retired. And, you know, if he does decide that 
enough's enough and he'd rather spend his time with his family and or whatever, then I think he'll regret that. And I think probably, you know, to give it one go, uh, at maybe, I don't know, a QPR, or, you know, even Premier League, you know, I mean, like, you know, you, you, the, the fact that, you know, he's come out and said that he's been fit for the last six, seven months, you just look at probably something else at why that wasn't the possible that he could play in a, you know, I know they had a bit, big, bit better of a season uh, at back end of last season, but still, a, a, a fit Jack Wiltshire in West Ham team surely must be a, an adage for me. You're very much in the leadership mould and you wore the captain's armband for several years. How do you, how did you handle that responsibility? Um, you say that it matured you, but what else could you tell us about having that? Um, it made me feel, it made me feel responsible, like. It was a privilege and it was like a, you know, a big responsibility and I took it, I think I really took it on board to make that like, like I need to, I need to go above and beyond now. I think if new players came to the club, it was my job to show them the ropes, make sure that they knew about Charlton, what it was about. I built up relationship with the supporters, you know, through social media and appearances and, you know, always being sort of accessible and present. I saw that as my responsibility, being the captain. Um, Did you view yourself as a captain before that? Is it something you always kind of looked to? Yeah, I had, I'd, I'd captain, I was never the club captain of Colchester, but I had captain the side um, quite a few times. I was starting to get to that stage where, I, you know, I thought I was ready for it. Um, but yeah, it really sort of, it, like I said, it was a game changer for me. It was, it made me worry less about myself all the time as well. You know, as a footballer, like you can be a team player, you can, or you can worry about yourself, or you can do a little bit of both. I sort of went from, like, I hope I have a good game today, first and foremost, and then if we win, bonus, to going the other way. Like, let's win, and then if I can do well and help the team, brilliant. Then everyone's a winner. But yeah, it's you sort of, it becomes less about you, and now it becomes about the group and like. You're almost the manager on the pitch and, and in the training ground and on the training pitch. You know, it's, it's more to, well, for me anyway, there was more to it than just an armband. In, in many sports, we see the women's game playing catch up to the men's form of the game in, in any sport, commercially, maybe on the pitch in some instances. However, the ladies went all the way uh, in 2016, Rio, Olympic gold. What has been the knock-on effect for the men's team having seen that success? I guess there's... I don't know if it creates more of a drive or if it's more obvious. Um, just commercially, it's huge. It was huge for us in the country. Um, have we taken advantage of that as a sport? No, not at all, especially in the league, um, which is disappointing coming from a player in the league. Um there's still no real drive to get it on air, whereas all, so if you look at the Dutch league, if you look at the Belgian league, if you look at the German league, more and more are getting media. Um, Beeston in the UK have really pushed it. All your genes have started to push it, which is great because it's basically you either have to follow them or get left behind and nobody wants to get left behind at this stage. Um, so sadly, I don't think we capitalized on what could have been a real game changer in terms of where the sport could have been commercially in terms of professionalism um, but they raise the profile hugely um, but I guess from a men's point of view it's just trying to emulate and get to that level as well I think if we can get to a point where we're really we're pushing medals in every single tournament I guess that's where any team wants to get to um, it's just the girls made it I think the women made it more obvious by how disappointing the men did in comparison, which is obviously results, you can look at that results driven or culture driven or however you want to look at it. At the end of the day, the men's team didn't perform anywhere to the level that the women did. So, What have you seen that the, or heard or understand that the women's team structure had that the, the men's team didn't? What, why did one go the way and one didn't? That's a tough question. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're not really sorry because you want an answer. Um, 
if I'm perfectly honest with you, I don't really know. Um, the women seem to have an incredibly cohesive group, um, whereas I don't think the men did. Um, and I think when the going was good, the men had it covered up a little bit. Whereas I think the women basically went through a period of crap performances and their culture stayed the same or it held together. And I think that's when you know a culture is really in a good place. Um, so recently, so for our games out in the Pro League, so we played four and lost four, which you can question. But what we had at the end of the trip was a a hot debrief that was incredibly open where everything was off the chest as a playing group, as a culture. And it was a pretty cool place to be when you're sat there and you know something's not perfect. But I wouldn't say our culture was bad. And I, I genuinely say it was very good at that stage as well in terms of the way people went about it, in terms of the questioning and the decisions and the conversations that were had. Incredibly open, incredibly... What's the word I'm thinking of? It wasn't polite as such as blunt, if that makes sense. So it was the in-between. I don't know what the perfect word for that is, but it was not mincing your words, but at the same time, it wasn't to the detriment of what you were trying to get across. It was respectful. actually... Yeah, it's probably the best way to describe it. It's, it was just a really respectful, open atmosphere where people who don't say as much had the opportunity to basically release what they were thinking. It kind of... It's funny, isn't it? Like if someone speaks all the time, sometimes it becomes a bit, oh, I'm not that bothered. Like you can't just zone out of it. Whereas what we had was actually people who don't say much in front of the group, but will have smaller conversations actually start opening up a bit more in front of the group. And that's a fantastic place to be because then you know someone's comfortable and you and everyone knows that everyone's got their, basically everyone's best opinions at heart. Like everybody wants to look after each other. But as a group, we need to get ourselves to a different level. And it was a pretty open and honest conversation that was pretty cool to see. And I can imagine that's what happened with the women's group in Rio when they needed it prior and then actually come the tournament, actually what they had was a fantastic framework with a great group and a great coaching staff and kind of everything came together harmoniously, whereas in the men's side it just didn't. Do you think you may look back one day and, and feel that the Tokyo journey started at that meeting? I started well before, um, but I think that's also... I think what was good about the, the meeting we had was that it was after a period that we had a great training block. So we thought we were in a really good place pre-games, then played the four games and then came out and said, do you know what lads, it's, it was a good training block. It wasn't great because we now know where the bar is. But what we had was a nine month block where we, we thought the bar was at a certain level and actually what it is is it's a lot higher. So whilst it was good, we've set an all right platform, there's still a lot of movement needed. Um, so I think, it is it a turning point for us? I'd like to think so, in terms of results. Culture is good, but there's definitely a need to drive standards, which is what's happened over the course of the last few weeks, which is really good to see. A bit of a random one here, but just interesting for me. If snooker, for some reason, was to introduce a doubles tournament, what player would best complement your game? I don't think they'd like to play with me now, but um, if, if, uh, well, uh, if, if I had to pick a doubles partner now, um, obviously, you, you know, you pick some of the current crop because they're brilliant, but I, it would be fun to play with Stephen Hendry, although I don't think we'd be able to sort of stop laughing or take it, because actually he's funny, yeah, he's a funny guy, and, and uh, he's also, he's a trainee, um, Larry David, he thinks he thinks he's Larry David from from uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, and he's. It would be very funny to sit in the corner with him while we were watching two other players play. Um, whether or not we gel, we dovetail nicely. I don't know, but Stephen Hendry took the game to another level when he when he sort of superseded my standard. Uh, he became far more of a, a the modern day player of a, a, aggressive. If you sort of, once again, apologies for making analogies with other sports, but they do seem to sort of tie in well. If you took Nick Faldo, who was me, and was, was a parring machine, 
and one event, not saying you can make a birdie, obviously, but centre of the green, played the game wonderfully well, okay. But then the next generation started attacking the flag more and pushing the boundaries, and that's what's happened to snooker. Stephen Hendry was the first player who started to change the balance of attack and defend and realised that attacking was the right way forward, whereas my generation and the people that I learned from were like, well, be careful, in a nutshell. Then, so, so the modern day game owes a lot, and the modern day player owes a lot to Stephen Hendry for changing the, uh, shot, the shot selection, uh, you know, what's right and wrong. Uh, so it would be fun to play with him, because you know, we could have a, we could have a good, good game, I'm sure, but uh, we'd probably end up cancelling each other out and just <laughs> arguing. I'd pay to watch it. <laughs> yeah, it'd be fun. I don't know who we play. We get slaughtered. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be good to watch. Like many of today's athletes, London 2012 proved an inspiration to the next generation. How important was a home-based Olympics for you? Yeah, I mean, so I was in the under-21s team at that time, and I remember training for that and obviously knowing some of the players in the senior squad. Um, but for me, I'm a huge sports fan. So the Olympics is the absolute top whether it's just watching, but obviously aspiring to play in it. And um, I remember watching one of the games that the GB girls were playing in and just seeing that, seeing how they fed off of the home crowd was just incredible and just so wanting. I knew I always wanted to go to Olympics, but to see that in the home crowd uh, was incredible and just gave you that extra fuel to want to do it yourself. And just to see how much in this country we love our sport and how much we get behind so many sports you know, hockey is often one of the most watched sports at the Olympics. It's, it goes out throughout the whole two weeks, so that helps. But um, people fall in love with different sports all over again in those two weeks. And it's great to showcase all the amazing talent that we have throughout this country. So uh, definitely gave me extra hunger to want to break into the senior team and to get there myself. Um, who were the Team GB athletes from any sport that really caught your eye at them games? Well, from any sport, wow. Well, um, so I am a bit, so hockey and rowing often, so at my school, hockey and rowing were two of the biggest sports and at Bisham Abbey where we trained, the rowers are often around there. Um, so Dame Kathleen Granger was obviously uh, someone that I had admired, but just seeing her overcome her adversity, I think adversity, she's won silver medals, <laughs> but um, to be able to keep going and want to be at her ultimate and so for her to get that gold medal um, at London with pretty much everyone cheering her on um, was incredible. And that's definitely something that's etched into my memory. Um, but, you know, there's countless others. Super Saturday, you can't. That was just an incredible day. And I actually remember being in, uh, we were in Holland building up to our European championships for the under 21s. And I think we had a team meeting and we said to our coaches, we need to be able to watch the athletics. We have to watch everyone go and I remember running back from the meeting just so that we could get in to see Jess um, finish on hers so that was incredible and I could go on and on and on Chris Hoy everybody that um, competed there was so inspirational but then to see the hockey girls and to know I'd played with quite a few players in the team but to see the likes of Kate and Helen Richardson Walsh playing um, just aspiring to be where they are was definitely something that I'll always remember.